Thank you all for coming again. So today's lecture is by Aki. Ah, encapsulated mas masculine dreams. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone um, remembers next week we also have a lecture. Scott Garner is lecturing. And yes, enjoys today's lecture. OK. Can you hear me? Uh, th those of you who don't know me, I'm Aki Ishida. I am currently serving as the Interim Associate Director for the School of Architecture. Um, before I took on this role, I used to teach second year and third year studio, and also I required a building technology class, which I no longer teach, um, so I don't get to know many of you nearly as well. Uh, but through these talks, I hope you get to know us well, and um, please um, ask questions or approach me afterwards with any questions or comments you might have. Um, I would like to leave about 15 to 10 minutes at the end for questions, so please uh, stay. I know that um, Professor Weiner has uh, done <laughs> unprompted homework and has watched a video of the demolition of this building this morning, so I know he has questions and uh, I'm hoping for um, more from the students. And this is a talk um, which is a compilation of multiple papers that I've, uh, I have written um, over the years on this building. And with each paper, the, my position shifted slightly. And also, I've written about this building through the lens um, of uh, gender, uh, through the lens of sustainability, and also um, restoration preservation and adaptive reuse. So I think there will be many questions um, that this talk will generate, and hopefully um, it will generate questions. Uh, like a time capsule, the photographs of the interior of the Nakajin capsule tower units shot by photographer Noritake Minami over the course of many years transport me back to the time in Tokyo of the 1970s where I spent my childhood. More immediately, they take me slightly less further back to a time nine years ago when I rented a unit in Tower B. On a suffocatingly humid day in July 2014, I rented Capsule B907 on Airbnb from someone who said had been active in the preservation movement for the tower. I had been following the controversy over the tower's fate, which was, at the time, still up for debate and found the arguments for its demolition as well, demolition uh, as compelling as those for its preservation as a cultural monument. These dueling arguments are writ large in Minami's photographs, which were taken from the early 210s onward and show the tower's capsules in an array of conditions. Some show units left to decay from water damage and neglect, while others capture those that have been diligently repaired and maintained by their owners. Back in 2014, I was struck by this disparity between the building's futuristic aspirations and aesthetics and the nostalgia that surrounded the preservation movement. With either preservation or demolition imminent, I was keen to witness the tower's tower firsthand before it reached the next phase of its life. Following the unit's unit owner's instructions on Airbnb, I walked past a security guard at the front desk to retrieve the room key from a stainless steel mailbox in the lobby. Riding the elevator with its bare light bulbs, which emitted a blue glow on the stained gray carpet, the neglected state of the tower became palpable. From the elevator landing, I spiraled up a few sh short flights of stairs, passing by doors covered with peeling paint, and makeshift plastic sheets and tubes that residents had installed as drainage to divert the leaking water that plagued the two interconnected towers. I turned the key to, B unit, or to unit B907, in contrast to the dim stairways reminiscent of neglected public housing towers built in post-war Tokyo. The unit's interior struck me for its brightness. The cabinets had been recently painted white 
and the original Sanyo mini refrigerator and fold-out desks were still intact. The host had written on the whiteboard that the bathroom had no hot water and the shower and tub could not be used. The toilet flushed feebly. The rented unit exuded impressions of a bachelor pad. It may or may not have been wiped clean after the previous guest, and the towers perhaps freshly washed, but not cer certainly not crisp. The Tanakagin capsule tower opened in 1972 as a few built work by the metabolists, a group of avant-garde Japanese architects who sought to develop a mode of non-Western modern architecture. Based on the Japanese notion of constant renewal and eternal adaptation, Kisho Kurokawa, the youngest founding member of the Metabolists, designed the power with a plan for its individual living units to be replaced every 25 to 35 years, while the concrete cores were estimated to last more than 60 years. In 2022, 50 years after the tower's completion, none of the capsules had ever been replaced, and the building suffered from significant structural and cosmetic deterioration. The questions over the tower's fate, whether to replace the units, reconstruct the original design, or demolish and build new, were debated over the past decade, until April of 2022, when the tower was surgically dismantled. Artists and architects who have lived in the tower over the past dozen years have illuminated conditions and stories that the promotional architecture of photography and monographs fail to convey. Amidst the debate over the tower's demolition, they uncover details of everyday lives housed within the building during its end-of-life controversy. Photographer Noritake Minami stayed in the tower 10 times over nine years, documenting the lives lived in the deteriorating tower. Portuguese architect Philippe Magalhaes and Ana Luis Soares lived in Unit B807 from October 2012 for 10 months while Soares attended the University of Tokyo and Magalhaes worked for SANA. In their capsule, the, the couple founded the practice Fala Atelier. The images by these artists and architects stand in stark contrast to the highly staged photos of the building's completion in 1972. The interiors depicted range. Um, the interiors depicted range from those that were left to decay from water damage and neglect, those carefully restored and finished like a showroom, to those that have been dr drastically altered and repurposed by the unit owners. The photographs not only show the declining state of the aging tower, but also intimate how the tower denied domestic acts of cooking, bathing, and even sleeping with privacy and darkness. They demonstrate the challenges, or the near impossibility, of adapting the capsules from those of the salarymen for which the building was designed to the li lives lived today that include women, children, and older adults. On a brighter note, they also depict idiosyncratic ways in which the residents made the capsules their homes, dorms, offices, and weekend homes for purposes other than those of the original design. The photos and the stories lay bare, however, that even though the tower was intended to evolve through a replacement of the capsules over time, the building's design, combined with the neglect by the building owner, did not allow the tower to adapt alongside the shifting societal values and aspirations. Lastly, material and ideological obsolescence of the tower began to suggest alternative approaches to impermanence and adaptability of architecture. Recent examples of adaptable buildings by, by such architects as Elemental and Lakaton and Vassal propose more flexible approaches to metabolist aspirations. Despite the material and cultural obsolescence of the Nakagin capsule tower, metabolist assertion that a building is an impermanent organism remain relevant and compelling 50 years later. With modifications, this building could suggest a model for sustainable architecture that adapts along with the changing ways to live, work, and play over the building's lifespan. The Nakagin capsule tower consists of two reinforced concrete and steel frame cores 
to which 140 capsules, each 8 feet and thir by 13 feet, are attached with high tensile steel bolts. Each prefabricated module consists of a bathroom unit, a circular window, a bed, built-in cabinets, stereo, and appliances designed primarily for lounging and sleeping. Each capsule is individually anchored to the concrete shaft intended to be replaced without affecting the others. The entire construction took only a year, with all 140, 140 units sold by the time of completion. Metabolist philosophy stood in opposition to Japan's pre-war modernization, which was to become westernized through industrialization. The two pillars of metabolist movement were to resist the course of cultural evolution based on Western values, and to seek out a contemporary language of architecture specific to Japanese culture. Kurokawa criticized those who, during World War I, colonization, and even after World War II, tried to resuscitate and imitate ancient Japanese structures. Instead, he argued for defining the present, not the past, as the backbone of Japanese culture. Kurokawa designed these capsules for Homo Molden, an elite businessman who would occupy the unit as a temporary residence and office in central Tokyo, allowing him to eliminate as much as 90 minutes of daily commute time from his main home in Tokyo's outskirts. The capsule was designed to be basic, and man's other needs, including socializing and meals, could be fulfilled by the city. Like a well-appointed business hotel that could be purchased by individuals or by companies for use by their employees, the building offered amenities including secretarial and housekeeping services. In the tower's deluxe units, built-in Sony color TVs and stereos offered the latest in entertainment technology. The tower has never provided cooking facilities. Instead, it always housed a food service on the ground floor. A cafe initially occupied the space, and later a convenience store that served bento boxes. Abundant eateries and pubs packed the streets and narrow alleys surrounding Shinbashi Station a few blocks away. Based on the metabolist philosophy founded in Japanese thinking, both, both ancient and modern, Kurokawa intended for the building to be permanent, uh, partially impermanent. The idea of constant renewal is rooted in the Buddhist religion. Kurokawa wrote extensively on the paradoxical Japanese practice of achieving permanence through impermanence, which is embodied in the predominantly lightweight timber construction used throughout Japan. He writes that because most important Japanese buildings are in timber, they accepted their own entropy. Buildings participate in the Buddhist idea of binme, or ongoing cycle of life and death. Moreover, the Buddhist idea of Muso holds that human beings should not become too attached to any one idea or place, but should always remain aware of being eternal in time. Kurokawa's position on impermanence also has a foundation in his youth spent in war-torn Japan. In a 2005 interview with Ram Kuhas, Kurokawa recalled witnessing his hometown of Nagoya, a city of 1.5 million, destroyed overnight by hundreds of bombers. Witnessing his city vanish in an instant impressed upon the young architect the impermanence of all things, including cities and architecture. Following the devastating losses in the war, Kurokawa continued to look to iconic buildings in traditional Japanese architecture which were studied by the imperialist architects of his father's generation. His father was also an architect. However, the metabolists did so in ways fundamentally different than those uh, of the previous generation. The metabolists pursued modernity in philosophy, not in style. Unlike the visually dominant traditions of the West, they sought the invisible, looking to venerable architectural practices of the past such as the Ise Shrine and Katsura Villa. Here, they found the notion of impermanence and prefabrication that they then transported, transposed into their own practice. Kurokawa says, we are talking about Ise as an invisible continuity. 
Every 20 years, the visible, the architecture, is rebuilt. We say the tradition has been maintained for 1,200 years, though the material is always new. He writes, the Japanese have never felt that materials themselves have a sense of eternity. On the contrary, they are and always have been conscious of the spirit and philosophy beyond the materials and regard the form as an intermediary conveying that spirit and philosophy of human beings." Unquote. Similarly, the Katsura has expanded twice over 150 years with different modules for each phase. And that at each phase, it was considered a beauty, quote, perfect as a constantly changing process, unquote. The palace embodied metabolic ideas of cyclical growth over time, which made it an apt precedent for the Metabolist Manifesto. Where Western culture might retain the every block of stone with which ancient te temples are built, in Japan, permanence of the artifact is secondary to the process of craft that is passed on for generations. This attitude is even evidenced in the Japanese laws which protect cultural properties such as manners and customs. And in the design of the title, a designation of the title National Living Treasure to a person, to a living person practicing a craft such as no theater or pottery. Despite the futuristic appearance and narrative of Homo Movens who would live there, the Nakagin Capsule Tower was shaped by these culture specific ideas that distinguish it from the European counterparts. Despite the now inevitable outcome, the arguments for its demolition have been as compelling as those for preservation as a cultural monument. For a building as radical in concept and form as the Nakagin Capsule Tower, its life of nearly five decades is already a miracle in the words of Arata Isozaki. Nevertheless, the building's failure to uphold its philosophy of continual change and growth makes its preservation controversial. And, and I'll play this uh, short clip oops, um, from Michael Blackwell's film. Sorry, you can't, unfortunately you can't hear him talking, but you can read the caption. なる商品から商品と違うものに変換させてしまったというように結果として考えられる何に変わったかというとそれは文化だ僕はこれは一つのこの時代の文化的モデルとして建物をこれは残しておく方がいいなと置くべきであろうというように考えます建築はまあ特にその都市の中にあってある経済活動もしなくてはならないしそれからまあそこに人々が住むという役割を持っているわけですからまあその働きに耐えられなくなった時にはこれは誰がどういう形でそれを保存する
The tower's preservation was widely supported by the international architecture community. In February 2005, the World Architecture News website published their poll of, of over 10,000 architects in 100 countries. The results were overwhelmingly in favor of saving the tower. 75% favored maintaining the core and replacing the capsules. 20% supported restoration to its original conditions and 5% voted for te total demolition. Many argued that the core concept of the structure should be honored, that the capsule be replaced and the tower restored as an example of the metabolist movement. There has been a striking disparity between the building's futuristic aspirations and aesthetics and the nostalgia that surround the preservation movement. However, these outside, those outside the global architecture community responded differently. On April 15, 2007, 80% of the capsule unit owners voted in favor of demolition and replacement with a more profitable building. This plan would give each capsule owner more than double the space for the same price as rebuilding the original plan. Consequently, in 2005, at the age of 71, Kurokawa launched a passionate campaign to save the Nakagin Tower. The architect garnered support worldwide, but in two, October 2007, Kurokawa died at the age of 73. By this time, development of the new tower had stalled for multiple reasons, including the economic recession of the late 2000s, the public suspicion of post-war architecture, and the general lack of interest in housing investment. In 2013, there were only 10 to 15 people living in the tower, while the rest were abandoned. Other factors stood in the way of the tower's preservation. The original construction cost of each capsule was, in US dollars, $4,500. Shortly before his death in 2007, Kurokawa's office estimated the replacement cost to be as high as $80,000. In 1972, the structure stood prominently as the tallest building for blocks around. Today, other buildings encroached tightly on three sides with an elevated highway on the south escalating the cost to replace the capsule by a crane. The tower also stood on prime Tokyo real estate. On average, the construction cost of building in Tokyo accounts for a tenth of its land value, a statistic which highlights the inclination for Japan's scrap and built uh, mentality. Moreover, the building management firm Nakagin stood complicated faced complicated security and utility, utility billing challenges with the building's multiple functions of apartment, office, and informal hotel. The building was no longer watertight and had lost running water, hot running water. Many abandoned capsules had moldy and compromised ceilings and walls and makeshift waterproofing contraptions made from plastic bags and tubes were common sites. The capsule walls were thin with limited asbestos insulation, making them hot in the summer and cold in winter, with no operable windows completely dependent on mechanical systems. Over the past decade, advocates for preservation of the tower had purchased unit one by one, including those who rented their units on Airbnb to tourists and architecture enthusiasts. Just prior to the pandemic, a foreign investor expressed interest in buying the tower, but the plans fell through. Now the capsules have been disassembled and are being distributed to museums around the world. The owners will demolish the concrete course to build a new building. And they, they have been torn down now. That the capsules will travel the world as Kurokawa imagined, but having reached obsolescence is an irony. The capsules were manufactured by metal fabricators at Daimaru who built, who typically built shipping containers. An apt symbol for a live-work capsule that Kurokawa envisioned as a mobile living unit that in the near future could also transport humans. In fact, in his capsule declaration of 1969, he calls a variety of vehicles, including the traditional Japanese palanquin, trains, cars, to automobile, or uh, aircraft carriers as capsules. As the dismantled ca 
capsules are shipped across the world, will they be cleaned and restored to their original state? And that is turning out to be the case. When Rachel Whiteweed cast the interior of an East London row house as an act of protest to demolition, the ashes left in the chimney cast marked the lives lived in the house. Similarly, with capsules as they stand, with their leaking ceilings, dusty umbrellas, and exposed asbestos, they convey realities and subjectivities lived by the owners and its occupants better than the restored capsules ever could. The Japanese masculinity of the 1970s emanate from the tower's original sales brochure from its developer, Nakagin, and the promotional video by Taisei Construction Company, which is playing here. The video shows the architects, and this is Kisho Kroka, by the way, wearing press business suits and with cigarettes in their hands, presenting their visionary ideas of capsule living and novel construction methods, precast concrete panels and metal capsules fabricated by makers of shipping containers that travel the world. These images remind me of my childhood in the west side of Tokyo with a father who commuted in a dark suit carrying a matching leather briefcase. Fathers of our generation came home after dinners and drinks with colleagues. I only knew of these salarymen's working lives from the photographs of their company gatherings and retreats, which consisted almost entirely of men, with the exception of a few female administrative assistants. These were the decades of unbridled ambition and exponential economic growth in Japan, the world of men who rebuilt the country following devastations of World War II. Metabolist architecture, which grew to accommodate an unexpected surge in population across cities and countryside, mirrors the population and economic boom in Japan. The Nakagin Tower was designed for businessmen whose high social status was associated with mobility. As such, they moved between multiple residences. After a late night at the office, they would dine and drink with their colleagues. In, instead of commuting back to their home in the Tokyo outskirts, they would sleep in their capsules until they returned to the office early next morning. The capsules isolated the men in a world without wives and children and underscored their separation from their domestic life. To be fair, Kurokawa set out to dismantle the pre-war patriarchal household structure where the most important space was the room in which the male head of the household received guests. He notes that following the war, the bedroom and living room of the married couple has taken on importance instead. In his 1969 capsule declaration, he advocates for independence of both genders when he writes, and I quote, Individuals, both male and female, have capsules of their own when they're single. When a man and a woman marry, they will furnish their respective spaces to form a necessary space for themselves as individuals. In reality, however, women remained at home in the outskirts of the city while the working men had their own capsule paid by their companies. Their capsules in downtown Tokyo enabled salary, salary men to distance themselves from domestic responsibilities. As Kuhlhaus and um, Hans Ulrich Obris write in, the, in their book, uh, Project Japan, they critically uh, interpret this outcome, and I quote, adjacent to the nightlife district of Ginza, Capsule Tower is a Japanese pied-à-terre for salarymen who prefer not to go home to the suburban bedroom community, unquote. Indeed, the tower left no room for, for families with young children or older parents for whom the women may be caring at home. Human figures are visibly absent from Minami's photographs of the capsules. However, the objects, garments, and a seeming lack of domesticity portray a masculine world. When asked if he noticed this absence of women during his time spent to photograph the building, he replied that even though around a quarter to a third of the tower's occupants were women at the time, at the time he took the photographs, Japanese cultural norms stopped him from asking permission to enter their capsules. In contrast, 
Magarais and Soares photographed the capsule interiors while interviewing residents in their units, including two women who agreed to be photographed. The residents learned of each other through the sign-up sheet for the only shower unit with hot water. And when uh, Magarais and Soares, as curious foreign architecture students, inquired if they could see their units, the residents also asked to see theirs in return. Although the couple did not speak Japanese and were accompanied by their bilingual classmates who served as their interpreter, the fact that Soares was a woman imaginarily offered safety and comfort for the female residents to show their private capsules and be photographed. Follows photographs that include women offer different gender perspectives on the interior uh, interior world of the tower. Nonetheless, with water leakage plaguing the tower throughout the dimly lit hallways and stairs, the security desk that becomes unmanned after midnight, and the general deserted state, the building does not offer a sense of safety for women traveling alone or staying alone. Despite the changing roles of women in Japanese society, the tower remains a world of man, world of men, isolated in their capsules. The photographs underscore the contrast between the current failing conditions of the, and the futuristic ideals with which, the, with which the building was designed, as well as the obstinate gender roles that have persisted in Japanese society over the past 50 years. It was around this time, the Nakagin Capsule Tower's completion, that my father traveled to the US for the first time to visit the headquarters of the 3M company in St. Paul, Minnesota. He came back inspired to move his family there, and a decade, decade later, he did. These were the, the decades of unbridled ambition and exponential economic growth in Japan. The world of men who built the country following the devastations of the war. Metabolist architecture, which grew out of accommodating the unexpected surge in population across cities and the countryside, uh, mirror the wide population boom in Japan. The Nakakin Capsule Tower is an embodiment of far-reaching aspirations and utopian visions of Japanese men of the 1970s, which have yet to return since the economic bubble began to burst in the late 1980s. Along with the fading ambitions and confidence of the men who built it and at whom it was targeted, the tower has deteriorated both physically and symbolically. Perhaps more significantly, the masculine ideals of the 1970s have reached obsolescence alongside the building. Compared to their fathers, the newer generation of Japanese men are generally thought to be less ambitious, and there is a term for this, herbivore men or grass eater men. In both professional and romantic relations, they lack assertion and proactivity associated with Japanese, traditional Japanese masculinity. If they choose to marry, more men now expect a home life with a partner or a family and share, share domestic chores as well as earning power with women, even though they lag behind men of other countries in performing housework. Despite these shifting values, the capsules did not evolve alongside them and were never replaced as the architect intended. In her book, The Japanese Women, Traditional Images and Changing Reality, psychologist Sumi Sumiko Iwao writes that the generation of women born in the decade after World War II rejected the male dominant household in their parents' generation and married men whom they saw as equals. All the while, their male partner continued to expect their wives to perform the traditional maternal role at home. Along with, the equal, uh, along with the lack of equal employment opportunity legislation and other support systems like childcare, architecture also stood in the way of women's aspirations for change. As with most works of modern architecture, the Nakagin Capsule Tower has been iconized through the highly stylized photographs that were taken at the time of the building's completion. For nearly its first four decades, the tower was publicized globally through the images from the 1970s, when it stood as the tallest building in the neighborhood, still populated with pre-war wooden low-rise buildings. 
Kurokawa, the youngest founding member of the Metabolists, an outspoken public intellectual, and a dapper cultural ambassador, and a celebrity, commanded the attention of the mainstream media and frequently appeared in weekly journals and women's lifestyle magazines. He addressed the public audience on television shows with his images and stories of metabolism, architecture, and modern ways to live, work, and play. It was only decades later, around 2010, the year that Minami first photographed the tower, the images of deteriorating, water-damaged capsules began to alarm the architecture community worldwide. Suddenly, the tower's fate was precarious. While architects, students, and Airbnb travelers started to broadcast the deteriorating condition of the tower on blogs and websites, the photographs by both Minami and Ata, uh, Fahla Atelier seized upon the quotidian details of everyday work and diversions of its residents, who appear ambivalent or nonchalant about the preservation controversy. Minami stayed in the tower 10 times between 2012 and 2021, for sometimes as long as six weeks in one stay, building up relationships over the course of a decade. After all, he depended on the generosity and trust of the preservation activists and their network of residents to enter the intimate interiors of their capsules. Magalayas and uh, Soares struck a conversation with a resident is, of one of the capsules while standing in front of the towers days after their arrival in Tokyo. Earnestly, as fledging architects and tourists, they told the man they wanted to live in a capsule. The man laughed and handed them a business card, and the couple soon moved into a capsule that was barely large enough to fit a double-sized mattress. Minami and Fala Atelier's photographs unearthed the everyday lives of an icon iconic building, the realities that oppose the architecture of spectacle and myths portrayed in the media and in architecture publications. The capsule was the capsules were stylized by design, always appearing as if a stage set for photography. Every capsule is 10 square meters and has the same circular window, which serves as a... Here we are within a single capsule, measuring about 8 Which by serves as a datum and a constant backdrop for every interior for adopting photograph. adopting such a module. In the first place, the Japanese traditional tea house is this size. Kurokawa drew an analogy to a camera whenever he described this mass in area. Oculus, which originally included a circular paper shade that opened and closed instance, radially. All the parts were prefabricated. He says in, in this same documentary that the Oculus car. was designed to have a mechanism resembling the a shutter of a camera. Runs throughout, as in the the window is visible from every point in the unit except the when one is in the bathroom. Minami's photographs also lay bare materiality not evident in the promotional photographs. While the futuristic appearance of the built-in cabinets and their modern electronics of the capsules suggest materiality of plastic or metal, carpenters built the interior cladding and cabinets in plywood, a practical, affordable material with a relatively short lifespan that suited the planned obsolescence of the replaceable capsules. The photographs also show that the wood interior made the capsules prone to mold and deterioration from humidity of Tokyo, further ex exasperated by poor plumbing design. Minami's photographs chart not only the building's state of neglect and deterioration, but also the different ways in which each capsule and the artifacts inside reflect the idiosyncrasies and characters of each occupant. Before the preservation, activists amplified their efforts around 2013. The tower's occupants could be categorized into three groups. Those who were there for practical purposes, including its convenient location. Those who had no other choice but to rent a unit in a dilapidated tower. And those who took an interest in its historical significance. The most intriguing unit interior photos are not those that attempted to restore the original conditions or the ones who furnished with minimalist decor, but those of the first two types of occupants. 
One of the units Minami photographed belonged to a fish broker. Unlike the owners of unit that include OMA books, IMAX, or mid-century modern furniture, the fish broker does not appear to be concerned with the capsule's aesthetic. He has replaced the original built-in cabinet with a large utilitarian desk and a metal wire shelving from which headphones and work-related papers hang. In a 2017 photograph of unit B506, which appears abandoned, a cutout map of Japan covers the unit door. On the dust-covered cabinet is a white construction worker helmet. Was this a temporary home of a construction worker who migrated across the Japanese archipelago? Like a detective's crime scene photographs, Minami's shots leave only fragmentary clues about the lives lived by the recent homo mulvins. Artifacts left in the nearly abandoned tower seem to belie the business suit masculinity of the architect and his client projected at the time of building's completion. The interviews that Soares and Magalis um, conducted while photographing the residents in their capsules offer a different kind of personal narratives that may be less enigmatic than Minami's images, yet as compelling and vivid in their descriptions. Uh, in, in this unit, uh, they met a couple, a 51-year-old industry worker and a 49-year-old part-time office worker who purchased the unit as their weekend home. They say they loved the building and found the, resi the residents very interesting. They purchased a unit that had the original cabinets intact and they did not renovate. Another unit on the upper floor uh, they photographed a 19-year-old college student who had rented the unit because of its central location and, quote, it's a very cool building despite it being really old. <laughs> the original cabinets had been removed when she moved in, and she says she bought all new furniture, which includes armoire and a bed. She says her friends admire the building and says she lives in a, not in a house but in a washing machine. In addition to photographs of capsules that are still occupied, uh, the photographs uh, capture units that have been severely deteriorated, primarily from water damage. In her book, Maintenance Architecture, the architect Hillary Sample writes that architects have treated the maintenance of building with indifference and that our contemporary culture privileges architecture in its original form more than the lived experience of it. In the case of the Nakagin capsule tower, for a variety of reasons, Nakagin neglected to maintain and replace the units. Without a systematic maintenance, the capsules could not evolve with the changing work culture, gender roles, and domestic life. At a moment before building's inevitable demolition, Minami's photographs captured lived experience in a tower that has reached obsolescence both as a physical building and as a symbol of masculine dreams. Moreover, access to parts of the building that require regular maintenance by the owners, including plumbing fixtures and pipes, are concealed from view and not optimized for access. The promotional video by the construction company shows a cast unibody plastic shell draped over a standard ceramic toilet fixture which restricts access to the, uh, the picture below. The architect intended for the capsule to be replaced every four decades, perhaps a reasonable, reasonable lifespan for plumbing fixtures, uh, but not for uh, building. Similarly challenging were custom cabinets with built-in television, tape deck, and other technologies that demanded replacement multiple times during the capsule's lifespan. Uh, finally, capsules were designed for salarymen who would stay to lounge and sleep after a long day of work. Presumably, this is not where men spent their weekends, the only time they would do um, main house maintenance work. Other modern buildings from the 1970s, including Centre Pompidou by Piano and Rogers, place the infrastructure on the building's facades. 
the infrastructure, infrastructure that is visually and physically accessible became a conceptual pillar in their architecture. Maintenance and not only facilitates physical longevity of a building, but also sustains attachment that develop between the owner and their homes. And, and um, th this is a Dymaxion House by Buckminster Fuller, which also makes maintenance of whatever fixture below um, very difficult. And you can see um, the small size um, of this unit. The lived-in conditions depicted in the photographs of Nakagin Capsule Tower suggest that sustainability of a building depends not only on selection of building materials and systems, but also on the resident's ability to adapt uh, their building environments as social expectations uh, and personal aspirations change. Over the past several years, the architect's architecture community has increasingly recognized the work of such practices as Elemental and Alejandro Aravena of Chile or Lacaton and Basal of France for their responses to these needs in ways that are affordable and accessible. With Elemental's Half a House, for example, the architects designed affordable housing so that each family can start half of a good middle-class house at a price that qualifies for low-income housing in Chile, and can build the other half over time. While Elemental have built new housing that can be adapted by the inhabitants, Lacaton and Vassal have modified existing structures grounded on their model, never demolish, always transform with and for the inhabitants. They have expanded the living spaces of existing public housing units by adding a partially enclosed balcony, which they call the winter garden. Uh, so here you can see that the balcony, uh, the winter garden that they are attaching um, to the existing building uh, perimeter. Unlike the tightly sealed glass curtain walls prevalent in contemporary residential buildings or the highly prescribed interior of a capsule unit, the, case, the, the ease of operability and adjustability by the users offer a sense of agency. These examples acknowledge and embrace impermanence, changeability, and indeterminacy of architecture. Admittedly, an extraordinary work of architecture, the Nakagin Capsule Tower, nonetheless, represented a particular type of domestic and professional ethos centered around men in which women were alienated, subjected to assistive roles both at home and office. The tower has reached its obsolescence in materials and ideology. At the same time, however, Kurokawa's interpretation of impermanence and continual growth in buildings such as Issei and Katsura Villa may offer ways of building that are less rigid and prescribed and more flexible and adaptable. Incremental adaptation, expansion, and reconstruction may also prove to be less wasteful and more sustainable and facilitate a building to evolve along with the changing societal values. The night of my stay in Unit B907 I could not bear the heat, humidity, and lack of privacy, the glaring fluorescent light from the adjacent elevated expressway, and the deprivation of human comforts we have come to ex expect, hot water, a functioning shower, and a sense of safety for a woman traveling alone. At 2 a.m., I searched online for a room at a Marriott a few blocks east and escaped down a stairway that appeared abandoned and unsafe and out past the front desk, now unmanned after hours. The next day at 6 a.m., I returned to the tower to photograph it in daylight and return the key. Thank you. Um, okay, we have 10 minutes. Um, I can take questions. Um, if, for me, as somebody who has been working on this uh, tower as a project, um, the tower 
these papers have generated more questions than I could answer, which led to additional papers. Um, or somebody who read a previous article asked me to write, expand on a certain idea that was mentioned. Um, so that, that's how the scholarship has grown over time. Um, and I, I could see you know, many topics being expanded upon by students as either papers or thesis projects. Um, I haven't seen a written scholarship on this, um, but I can speculate that um, something like this, a capsule environment like this, I think would really only work um, if they were treated as hotels, not as residences. Um, I think we as social animals need more connections, uh, social connections, uh, than what this capsule um, could offer. And the, these were admittedly uh, meant for temporary stays um, in a place where real estate is very expensive, or was at least. It's more, it seems relatively much more affordable today. Um, but at the time of economic boom, um, real estate was very expensive. Sorry, I couldn't hear the. the okay. um, I said, do you think they would have had a uh, different societal impact of the hotel if the units had been uh, If the units had been replaced, I think that the tower would could have had a very different life if the units had been replaced. Uh, it's been speculated that Nakagin was really interested in the initial spectacle at the time of its completion. They loved the story that these capsules would be replaced over time, um, but they really hadn't made a realistic plan to have the crane you know, somewhere accessible. Um, and uh, if the units had been replaced, um, Kurokawa said that it would it would adapt to different um, societal expectations and um, technology. So I, I think the outcome could have been very different if the replacement had taken place. Yes. I think depends on the situation, of course. Um, but uh, I think it's worthwhile considering partial replacement as a strategy for growth and um, persistence and longevity. Um, it's, it seems wiser to think of a building that way um, rather than complete, uh, preserving the entire building as designed uh, in its entirety, or tearing it down completely and building uh, a brand new building. Yes. It seems like the cost for the building to adapt overshadowed its, the, 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 uh, its the philosophy that it was trying to, to live by, which to me is ironic because the basis of the idea is for the inhabitants to be able to participate in the economy. So do you think that perhaps maybe the reason that this building failed is because Kurokawa had a misunderstanding of this bit? <laughs> well, did, did he misunderstand human nature? Yeah. Uh, or no. Seems, or seems like <laughs> his dream distorts, distorts his attitude towards how we live as, as people. Yeah. I, I don't think we, any, any architect, you know, can um, always accurately 
for, um, predict in how people would change or how their um, mindset would affect how they treat architecture, uh, but certainly didn't turn out to be the case, I mean, whatever he imagined. Um, and I think that's dependent on many factors, as, as I mentioned. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I, there's a lot of uh, attention on uh, ecology of care in, in the past. I, I've been seeing a lot of uh, conference call or um, call for proposals for papers on maintenance and care of our buildings. Um, I think that's something that we as architects don't design into the building. Um, we often expect the uh, the inhabitants and the owners to care for them. And we, we're not part of the maintenance team, but we could participate in the maintenance process by designing or offering that as part of the um, design. Um, as you saw, this building really wasn't designed with maintenance in mind. If you look at the spacing between units, it's nearly impossible to access the plumbing pipes. Yes, yes. It served the need for maybe a decade. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, this is an example of a very exclusive building. It's, it's opposite of uh, inclusion um, that we, you know, um, we try to design for, um, many of us, I think. Um, yeah, I think that the exclusive niche certainly contributed to people not really caring long term um, whether uh, the, this building survived or main, or was maintained well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, as you saw in the survey, you know, their overwhelming majority wanted to preserve it, but they also didn't see how deteriorated it was, how difficult it was to maintain it, how uncomfortable it is to occupy. I, I couldn't, I didn't last all night because it was so uncomfortable. Um, if if uh, all those people who were in support knew what it's really like, the lived experience of the building, um, I think they may question whether they think that it should be preserved or not. Um, and, and I know that SF Mo San Francisco MoMA was the first one to purchase one, or at least you know, publicize it widely. Um, I don't think it has arrived yet, but as far as I know, it's been completely cleaned up. Um, so it's not preserved in the lived condition um, of the, cas the capsule at the end of its life. So I'm not sure how well that serves, you know, to um, preserve that and show that condition in a museum. I, I think you, you have to show that with the photographs um, by these artists. Um, nope. Do you think that the, like, the societal niche 
decayed faster than the building itself. Like, <laughs> it's interesting, it, you know, yeah. It's not getting preserved because it no longer serves the same role. That may be, yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I think Japan in this time period, which is really my lifetime, um, <laughs> really um, transformed in an extraordinary way. It, 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 the building seems to really follow the rise and fall of the Japanese economy um, and the confidence and ambition of the Japanese people. So yes, I think in maybe different time period, it probably would have had a very different trajectory. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to talk, take, take your question down here. I wanna be respectful for people's time. Thanks.